Amen. Uh, so we are going to read a very familiar scripture. I'm going to hope to show you some things according to the Word of God today. I asked you to please keep the attitude of worship. It's going to be a sacred time today because I, from what God has shown me in my prayer time uh, that He wants to do in this altar today, I just ask that you stay in the mindset to receive what God has for you today. John chapter 8, starting in verse 1. And Jesus went into the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery in the very act. And when they had set her in the midst... They said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such be stoned, but what say you? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down, and with his finger he wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when he continued asking, so when they continued asking him, he lifted himself up and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground, and they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone. And the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw no one but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for such an anointing of your word. Bless the reading of your word today. And God, I ask you to anoint these lips of clay today that I can speak what thus saith the Lord to your people. Clothe me in your anointing today, God. I can't do this without you. I don't even want to attempt to do it without you. Hide me behind the cross, Lord, and help us all, God, to receive from you today what you'd have for us to. Father, we'll be sure to give you all the praise for it's in the wonderful Matchless name of Jesus, we pray. Everybody said amen. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Tell your neighbor, it's good to see you in God's house today. Amen. I want to preach to you this morning on the thought, critics and Christ. Critics and Christ. I want to paint a picture first of what is going on when, this, when John opens chapter 8 of his epistle, here's the scene that he paints. Caught in the act of adultery, dragged naked by force into a public gathering place, humiliated by her sin, separated from anyone or any lover to protect her, judged and sentenced to death without trial by self-righteous leaders and placed before the king of kings who is pure and holy. This is how the apostle John describes the opening scene in this passage of scripture. It's a dramatic scene. Here is Jesus in the temple courtyard teaching and, and preaching and all of a sudden he hears a commotion come in and religious leaders are dragging a naked woman in before him and they throw her down before him, exposing her, exposing her sin, claiming that she is to die for her sin. Self-righteous leaders saying, oh, she has to go, she has to die. And all this thrown before a pure and holy king you know, we, we read this story many times, but can you imagine what was going through this lady's mind? Can you imagine the humiliation? Can you imagine the embarrassment for her whole, her whole action to be laid out before everybody, for her to be made a public spectacle in front of everyone? 
think about this. We read this story many times, but we just read right through it. In the text, though, that we read, John identifies two voices that are present in many situations we face. The critics and Christ. A critic is someone who judges the work of somebody else whether it is a food critic or an art critic, but they judge somebody else on their opinion. A critic gives their opinion of what somebody else does. How many of you know that there are critics everywhere? There are critics everywhere. There's always somebody that has an opinion. Well, if I was in charge, I would have done it this way. Well, if I could do it, I would do it this way. And it even creeps over into the church. Amen, because that is why we have so many storefront curses. I didn't say storefront churches. I said storefront curses because people get in church and they are critical of the way leadership is doing things and they think they could do it better. So they go out and say, I want to do it better and go out and start my own church with five or six people. Hello? Hello? And we have one on every corner because somebody got mad somewhere and thought they could do it better. Hello. In the text, the voices of the critics was to condemn and criticize, destroy, mock, and humiliate. In other words, they were exploiting the failure of this woman why is it that even today people want to exploit the failures of others? People want to take somebody else's problems and put it in the limelight. Why? Because for a moment it takes them away from the conscience that they are, they are messed up themselves. I think many times when somebody wants to talk about somebody and put somebody else down, it's because they are under conviction themselves and the only way they can find some relief without dealing with what's in front of them is to go after somebody else. I'm a firm believer that, that people that run people down and, and talk about people and, and run people over, the real problem is themselves uh, and the complex that they have with themselves. So don't think it's personal many times when somebody's coming after you. A lot of times it's because they're jealous. Hello, I had this conversation with my, one of my baby girls. Some people were coming hard at her. And I said, baby, don't worry about it. I said, you just keep being you and you keep doing you and let them say what they want to say. Amen. They were exploiting the failure of this woman. Now, there was no question, no question at all whether she was guilty or not. The scripture says she was taken in the very act of adultery. In the very act, there was no question if she was guilty. But the thing that stands out to me is that the Pharisees we're using this woman's failure as a way to try to strengthen their position. If you have to step on others to get to where you want to be, it ain't worth it. If you have to hurt other people just to get to the place you want to be, it ain't worth it. If you have to wound other people just to become popular, it ain't worth it. I refuse to use people as stepping stones to, to get myself higher. Amen. But there are many people out there that will use the failures of others mm, to try to promote themselves. That, that's what stands out to me. I'm not saying the woman wasn't guilty. Yes, she was guilty. But here is somebody using her failure to try to boost themselves. Hmm. Let, 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 me, let me go a little deeper than that. Somebody failed. Oh, you know so-and-so failed. and they, they blowed it over there. Won't you come over here with me? We don't do stuff like that. You know, oh, over at that church, that's going on, and we don't agree with that. Won't you come over here? We, we, we don't do it like that. Oh, they messed up over there. That, that person's so messed up, won't you come over here and hang out with us? We, we ain't going to do that. That's using somebody else's failure, somebody else's mistakes to promote yourself. Are we, we all right? 
Let me move on. These guys weren't concerned. The Pharisees weren't concerned about the purity of their town. You know, many people want to come, oh, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. She's got to be stoned. Their motive was not for purity in their town. They wanted to trap Jesus and discredit him because the message that Jesus was preaching was a threat to their kingdom. The message Jesus was preaching was a threat to them. How many of you know that the message that Jesus preached was not what put him on the cross? Because Jesus preached of love and forgiveness. Come on. And helping people. The message wasn't what put Jesus on the cross. Jesus' message was pure and was holy. But what put Jesus on the cross was religious leaders that Jesus was a threat to them. The religious leaders crucified Jesus because he was a threat to the way they had been doing things. If you want to get crucified in the body of Christ, start changing the way things have been done for 30 years. You will get tarred, feathered, talked about, ridiculed, run down. (laughs) I'm going to leave that alone. That's kind of on my resume. (laughs) The Pharisees had built a little empire by exploiting people and false teaching for personal gain. Oh, God, help us to get rid of the false teachers in the pulpits that are only in it for personal gain. God, help us to get rid of the playboys in the pulpits. Come on. God, help us to get rid of people that only want to expose people's desire and hunger to be free for personal gain. Oh, gosh, there's so many people out there today that will find people that are in need and they will exploit their need for personal gain. And the people are so desperate for a change that they'll go along with it. This is what the Pharisees were doing, and I'm sorry to say, but it's still happening today. It's still happening today. This whole ordeal, though, with the woman was a planned setup. Have you ever thought about that? This whole ordeal was orchestrated by the Pharisees for two purposes, to destroy this woman's life and to trap Christ. Why did they want to destroy this woman's life? Because probably most of them were guilty of doing the same thing that they were accusing her of, and I'll show you that in a little bit. Why did they want to destroy her? Because they scared her secret was going to get out. Woo. Oh, just because they talk holy, they look holy, they act holy, don't mean they are holy. Just because they play the part don't mean they have, don't have skeletons in their closet. Amen. There's closets in my life that I done locked the key and swallowed it. And if you'll be honest, you got some skeletons in your closet too. All of us have skeletons in our closet that we don't want nobody to know about. I'll be praying over mine, ashes to ashes and dust to dust. You better go back to nothing. (laughs) Amen. If y'all don't pray that, I'm sorry. They stuff me and God knows about that's going to the grave. Let me move on. Well, God don't even know about it no more because the Bible says he cast your sins as far as the east is from the west and remembers them no more. So let me move on. This whole ordeal, though, was obviously a planned setup. It is obvious that the Pharisees didn't accidentally catch this woman in the very act of adultery. In the very act, they didn't just accidentally walk by and be like, oh, what's going on here? It was a plan. This was a planned attack to destroy her and create a trap for the ministry of Jesus. How do you know it was a planned trap? Because where was the man? Where was the man? I will show you in just a moment according to the word of God that according to the law of Moses, you can read about it in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, that if someone was caught in the act of adultery, the actual law was both parties had to be present and were stoned. 
So this was a setup because they only brought her and did not bring him. So that lets me know that he was probably one of them. He was probably one of them. Let me move on. When you are a child of God, the enemy is constantly plotting on you. Don't you ever think that the enemy's not plotting on you. Don't you ever think that the enemy won't put people in your life just to gain information. Hello? I, I, I'm going to tell you a story. There was a man that uh, this a man and his wife that this lady befriended him. Wanted to talk to him and all that, but she was actually planted in their life. Come on. Planted in their life to gain information on them and was taking it back to other people. And then when all this came into a, a, uh, a court setting, just say, we'll just say a court setting, all this came into a court setting, this lady that had be, been friended this couple, gaining information on them, walked in as a witness for the other side. And the man told me this. He said, when she walked in the room, he said, the spirit quickened my heart and said, Judas just walked in. So don't you think that the enemy's not plotting on you. The, the Pharisees were continually plotting to try to bring Jesus down. He was out there doing good. He was out there preaching love. He was out there preaching forgiveness. And the whole time he was doing good, somebody was plotting on him. So don't ever think the enemy's not plotting on you. He will try to bring you down to destroy you and bring shame on the ministry and message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And even those people that are lost and don't know the Lord, the enemy will use their failures to try to keep them down and make them believe that Jesus can't turn it around. But I'm here to tell somebody today that the devil is alive and God can take any mess and turn it around. God can take anything that you've been in and turn it around. God can take your mistakes and turn them around. God can take your failures and turn it around. God can take your mess and give you a message. God can take all of your failures and give you victory. Amen. We don't sing a lot about the victory anymore, but if you're still here today, it's because God has given you the victory over life. He's given you the victory over your past he's giving you the victory over your failures oh hallelujah the enemy wants to plot on you to destroy you their plan was to destroy this lady's life and to bring reproach on Jesus that is why when you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior there's a big old target gets painted on your back. Why? Because if the enemy can get you to fail, then he can get it to bring reproach on the kingdom of God because you wear his name. Tracking with me. Why else does the enemy fight us so hard? Man, I'm over here. (laughs) I'm over here still struggling with issues and the devil's fighting me like, man, I ain't even got it all together. But the enemy don't fight you on how you're living and what you're doing in your life. He fights you based on the name that you carry. Oh, Why? Because inheritance has nothing to do with what you do. Inheritance is all about who you are. Inheritance is all about who you are. Somebody's not going to leave you a big inheritance that don't even know you, even if you're a good person, but they leave inheritance to somebody that carries their same last name. Are y'all tracking with me? So the enemy fights you because of the name that you bear. We read nothing in the scripture. Watch this. We read nothing in the scripture where Jesus was ever tempted until he was baptized And a voice rang from heaven and said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And the Bible says, immediately Jesus was drove into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And all three times that the devil tempted him, he said, if you are the son of God, 
make these stones bread. If you are the Son of God, do this. Notice that at the moment that Jesus started wearing that name, as the Son of God, the enemy comes. And when you take up uh, your cross and you begin to follow him and you become a son, daughter of God, amen, the enemy comes to test that. Hallelujah. The enemy comes to test that. <laughs> the critics will proclaim your demise. But Jesus has come to give you life. And that life more abundantly. They told Jesus, watch this. They told Jesus, they said, the law of Moses said she must be stoned. But as I told you before, this is only a half truth. Woo! That was a half truth. According to the law of Moses, Leviticus 20 and 10, Deuteronomy 22 and 22, it required both parties to adultery to be stoned. Okay? So when they only brought her and said the law says she's required to be stoned, that was a half truth. Whew. <laughs> they only brought one half. <laughs> Even though she was guilty, she was only half. So it was a half truth when they commanded her to be stoned. How many of you know that people love half truths? They will get half the story and run with it. Oh, oh, preacher, I love you. But, and, and you get into, just say somebody gets in a problem with somebody else. I love you both and I'm not choosing sides. It's no secret. I'm going to tell you a story. I'm very transparent. Some people tell me I'm too transparent, but that's just who I am. 2008. I got divorced. And I had a lady call me two years later. And when she called me two years after that, she said, I need to talk to you. I said, oh, Lord. Last time you called me, you was butt dialing me and was talking about me. I need to talk to you. I said, okay, what's up? I guess I need to ask you to forgive me. I said, for what? She said, I am so tired of every time I hear your name, I get mad. I said, oh, to now. <laughs> she said, I'm so tired of every time I hear your name, you get mad. She said, you don't know how bad I was wounded because you got a divorce. I said, oh. She said, it just hurt me. And I said, well, I'm sorry you was hurt because that happened. I said, it happened to me and I walked through hell, but I'm sorry you was hurt by it. Y'all can see where this is going. <laughs> and I said, I'm sorry you were hurt by that. And she said, I, I, just, I just got so wounded by this. I said, no, you weren't. She said, what you mean? I said, you weren't wounded. I said, my ex-wife was wounded. And I said, you bought into her offense and made it your own and you got wounded. I said, you got to be careful because you buy into somebody else's offense and make it your own offense. And she said, well, I hadn't thought about it like that. I said, now you have. God bless you and have a good day. <laughs> Let me move on. She only had half the truth and she ran with it. Amen. Half the truth and she ran with it. If you want the whole truth, come see me if you got about an hour. People love to go on half truths. The enemy will use whatever he can to try to bring you down. Some of you, if you're here and you're new and you didn't know this pastor's been divorced, I'm, I'm sorry. Trust me, it happens. The enemy will use whatever he can to bring you down. <laughs> but I love Jesus. When they told this to Jesus, the Bible said he stooped down and started riding in the ground as though he heard them not. Can I preach right here for a minute? Sometimes you got to ignore ignorant people. Sometimes it ain't even worth your response. Sometimes you got to uh, just let ignorant people be ignorant. Because there's one thing about ignorant people. I'm using that word a lot, ain't it? It's fun to say ignorant. One thing about ignorant people. 
They always expose themselves. Amen. Because you can only hide ignorance for so long. Some of you staring at me hard. I'm going to have to move on. Preacher, you ain't supposed to call people ignorant. <laughs> when you don't know something, but you pretend that you do. If you don't know what 2 plus 2 is, come on. But you claim that you know what 2 plus 2 is, and you're over there telling people 2 plus 2 is 6. Guess what? You're ignorant. So ignorant people, I'm not being ugly, ignorant people go off what they think to be true when they really don't know. Okay? Y'all tracking better with me now? Okay, y'all stay and eat with me. It's going to be all right. Just going to have to get somebody to taste my food first. <laughs> when they told Jesus, this woman deserves to be stoned, he got down and started writing in the dirt as though he heard them not. <laughs> he didn't, if he didn't... Uh, he acted as if he didn't hear them, stooped down and wrote on the ground. He wasn't even quick to respond or lash out at them. I've had to work on that. I've had to work on that in my life when people come at me not to lash out immediately, to step back, think about what I need to say, delete that text out of my phone, take all them capital letters and exclamation points out of it, that little red emoji with the stuff across his mouth, Y'all know what emoji I'm talking about. It's got that little red emoji with the black tape and the different symbols on his mouth. That's that cussing emoji. <laughs> Y'all know what emoji is. I say it on your Facebook. He wasn't quick to respond or lash out. Sometimes we got to learn how to be quiet. Amen, Brother Cecil. <laughs> Sometimes we got to learn how to be quiet. Sometimes we got to learn that, you know, not everything that happens deserves your response. Amen. We say it all the time. Be like, just be the bigger person. That's hard sometimes. You know, especially when somebody coming at you and their life is so jacked up. You know? People come at me hard when I got a divorce. I can't believe you are preaching you got a divorce. I can't believe you got six kids with six different men. See, sometimes you don't have to say it. <laughs> Let me move on. It's just a work in progress. <laughs> Lord, forgive me. <laughs> I'm going to move on. Y'all, I, I covet your prayers. <laughs> sometimes, amen, preacher, you got to learn to be quiet. I'm pointing at myself. Let them talk. Let them assume. Let them, let them say what they're going to say. Amen. Jesus was like that. He wasn't quick to just jump in. And say what he wanted to say to them. Why? Because many times they come at you. It's a trap to try to bring you down. It's a trap to try to get you into things. Just because they say it. Don't mean you have to respond to it. Amen. In the words of Medea. Just because they call you something. Don't mean you have to answer to it. Y'all thought I was fit to say something bad. Didn't you? No faith in your pastor. At all. Medea, <laughs> Medea says just because they call you something don't mean you have to answer to it. I mean, just let, let, let people talk. Then move on. Don't waste all your time and energy fighting what they say. And they got even more angry because Jesus ignored them. Amen. Let them get mad. Let them run off. And then they kept saying, come on, you got to tell us, Jesus, what's, what the, the, the law says she's got to be stoned. The law says she has to be stoned, Jesus. And Jesus stood up, looked at them, made this statement so powerful. He is without sin among you. Let him first cast a stone at her. Then he stooped back down and started writing in the dirt again. Do we know what he was writing? Absolutely not. It's, it's dangerous to speculate what he was writing. I have my ideas of what he was writing, but we won't go into that. He stooped down. Started writing. Notice something about him. He didn't address their claims about the law of Moses outright. But he did address she was guilty to be stoned. Sure. You got a stone in your hand. If you're without sin, throw it at her. The law says 
You know, Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. The law says stoner. He said, but if you got no sin in your life, throw it. No sin in your life, throw it. He didn't address the law of Moses outright, but he did address she was guilty to be stoned, but only by a sinless person. You see, they came with a design to accuse him, but were forced to accuse themselves. Wow. They came with a design to accuse him, but were forced to accuse themselves. The Bible says they begin to drop stones and leave one by one. Very important that we don't skip over that. Not all together, but one slips out quietly and then another. Isn't it amazing how when you are doing what you're supposed to do for God, the voices start to drop off. The voices start to drop off. They didn't all leave all together, but one at a time. You know, critics won't be silenced all at once, but God has a way of shutting them up. How many of you know that you don't even have to respond to critics? Just let God bless you right in front of them. Just let God bless you right in front of them. People want to say, oh, this and this and this, and you just keep doing what you need to be doing and walking in blessings and walking in favor and letting God use you and letting God bless you. Amen. You ride by in your new car, just leaned over a little bit and be like, what's up? You go unlock your new house and you give them deuces as you shut the door. Let God bless you right in front of them. Why? Because they don't know where what you and God's got worked out. Amen. And when God wants to bless you, he always does it publicly. And I, when the critics start to, start to get upset, I'm like, oh, God, you're thinking to bless me again because the word of God says you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Uh, when the enemies start barking loud uh, and when they start coming at me, I start getting excited because I'm like, we're going to the sizzler. Amen. Because God's about to bless me right in front of them. Man, young people's like, what's the sizzler? Man, critics won't be silenced all at once. And the Bible says they went from them, from the youngest, from the oldest to the youngest. From the oldest to the youngest. The old or more seasons have to set the example for the young ones to follow. We have to set an example for our children to follow. We have to set an example for this next generation to follow. If they see us being critics, what are they going to be? If they see us halfway serving God, they're going to halfway serve God. If they see us playing patty cake with Jesus on Sunday, then living like the devil on Monday, come on. We wonder why our kids are so confused, don't know which bathroom to use, don't know if they a boy or a girl, don't know what they want to do because they've been raised by a lot of parents that are one way at church and one way at the home and they see them confused about who they are and it opens that door for the enemy to come in and confuse them because the Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Y'all ain't shouting me down, but this is all right. A double-minded man is stable in all his ways. If they see us living a double standard, they will do the same. Amen. If they see us lukewarm serving God, they're going to do the same. If they see us give in to our addictions, they're going to be the same. I have a family member that cusses like a sailor. It's a woman too. She made me blush. Cusses like a sailor. One of her kids come up and dropped an F-bomb. She slapped him across the face. And I'm standing there like, how are you going to hit him, hypocrite? When he, you, you the one that taught him how to cuss like that. Come on. You over there, three sheets to the wind, drunk. My kids ain't going to be like this. Well, you setting the example for them to follow. Amen. Parents are setting the example. I went over to East Marion 
uh, to show my cop car. We had a day of showing different things, and I was letting kids climb all in my patrol car, and they were looking and turning the lights on and the sirens and all that, and they were having a big time. And I had a little canister that has pepper spray in it on the back of my belt, and a kindergartner kid come up to me and said, Is that a bong? A bong is an instrument used for smoking marijuana. And a kindergartner come ask me that. No, baby, that ain't a bong. Why? Because we are children are being raised in a generation where the example of failure is being placed before them. And we as God's people have to show them an example of success. Men, we have to show them an example of success. We got too many young men that don't know if they're a man or a woman. That don't even know anything about being a man. Why? Because we too worried, men's too worried about having your pants down around your knees. Being 50 years old playing video games all day. Not wanting to get out and work. Laying up in the house living off somebody else's child support. Come on, you, your wife out there working three jobs and you laid up on the couch playing video games. Rise up, men, and be a real man. Rise up, men, and be a real man. Take care of your family. Come on, I'm going to get on my soapbox, but I'm going to have to be careful. If you're going to lay down and have them, be man enough to take care of them. Amen. If you ain't ready to be a daddy and take responsibility, keep your britches up. Ladies, if you ain't ready to be a mama and take care of your kids, keep your britches up. Amen. It ain't your grandmama's place to raise your kids. All right. We got to set an example. We have to set an example for this next generation. Amen. I'm hurrying, y'all. So everybody started dropping stones and started leaving. And after everybody was gone, it was just the woman and Jesus. He asked her, he said, where are your accusers? Is there anybody left to accuse you? And Jesus said, no. I mean, and she said, no. And Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. He forgave her sin because he had the power to forgive sins and told her to go change her life. And this is where I want to preach to you just for a few moments and then we're going to close. He did not condone her sin. But he, but he didn't condemn her sin either. He forgave her sin. I've been saying this a lot, and I'm going to say it again. You can love somebody without condoning their sin. You can have the love of Christ without condoning their sin. And you can love them and not condone but just because you don't condone don't mean you have to condemn. None of us have the power to condemn. None of us have the authority to condemn anybody else. None of us. Why? Because the Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In other words, we are all this woman. Well, I ain't never committed adultery, but you lied. I ain't never committed adultery, but you stole. Well, I ain't never committed adultery, but you gossip. I ain't never committed adultery, but you spread rumors. Well, I ain't never did this, but you did this. Come on. None of us are guiltless. We are all guilty. But praise be unto God by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. We've been washed clean. And we need to remember that. We need to remember that we have been forgiven. That we have been this woman. And some of us have had our lives put on display for the world. Some of us have felt the shame and the humiliation. Some of us still feel it today. Watch this. The woman in this story was guilty. The depravity of the Pharisees did not make the woman any less guilty. But her encounter with Jesus changed her life. Now there are many today 
who are very much like this woman. They've come into the church, perhaps have made strong commitments to Christ and have the Spirit of God living in them, but they still walk as cripples. They have been stoned and ridiculed. They may not be physically broken or bowed over, but they are wounded within. There are a lot of people, and I'm bringing it home, there are a lot of people in this church who have been wounded, who have been broken, and they have made strong commitments to God, but in their life they still walk as a cripple. Because they come to church with a smile on their face does not mean they're not bleeding inside. They come to church and they lift their hands does not mean that they're not still struggling. That they don't walk in and the enemy put in their mind, I wonder what they're saying about me. They all know what I've done. They all know where I've been. How do you know this? Because it still happens to me. I walk into places where there's other, other ministers and the thing that starts running through my mind is like, I know they don't like me. I know they talked about me. Why? Because it gets back. I know this and, 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 and all that. I, I still, at times, I feel like I don't even want to be here. Come on. People ask me all the time, why, why, do we, why do we not retain so many people that step through the doors of our churches? Because something about it made them so uncomfortable that they didn't want to come back. Did they feel judged? Come on, let me preach. Did they feel judged? Did they feel like everybody was staring at them? Did they feel like everybody was rehashing their past? Did they feel like they were before the critics? Or did they feel like they had an encounter with Christ? Think about that. And I know it's, it's human nature. We get so skeptical of new people that walk in our churches. What are they doing here? Lord, my God, the roof's going to fall in. So-and-so came to church. Oh, my gosh, so-and-so went to the altar. We must have missed the rapture. Somehow, the church must find room to throw off condemnation and give life and healing. This story reveals that we all face situations where different voices compete for our attention. All of us are going to face a situation where these voices compete for our attention. Are you going to listen to the critics? Or are you going to listen to the voice of Christ? We fail to recognize that the world or the crowd from which we so often seek approval and affirmation really don't care about us at all. We are just tools to be used and discarded as needed to advance someone else's personal gain. Like the Pharisees, we're all guilty of pointing out the failures of others while ignoring our own. But we must choose whether we're going to be a critic or we're going to be a representation of Christ. Don't live under the condemnation of critics or under the condemnation of self. Because Romans chapter 8 and verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. And I believe that there's many people, even some in this church, that you can't get over condemnation. You're struggling with it. Man, I just, I can't get over what I've done. I can't get over how bad I've failed. And when you try to do something good, it's always nagging in the back of your mind. I wonder what they're thinking about that. I wonder what they're thinking. And I want to do work for God, but I can't get over some of the things that I did. Can't get over the many times I told God I was going to do better. 
man, I blew it. I can't get over all the times that I made promises to God and I didn't keep them. Everybody knows what I did. Everybody knows where I've been. How can God ever use me? That is a lie of the devil. And I'm here to tell you today that what the Lord laid on my heart for this altar service is that if you will give it to Him today, He will lift all that condemnation off of you. He will lift all that regret. He will lift all of that, uh, all that hurt, all that bitterness, all that pain, all that anxiety off of you. Because there is no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Would you stand with me? Everyone bow your heads with me today. Oh, how much we love you, Jesus. Just need some to start worshiping right now. If you don't have to leave, please don't leave. This is a sacred moment. How much we love you, Jesus. your hands this way as we pray for these this morning. 